We on? There we go. Hey, I am so glad to be with you guys tonight. Uh, so I had the chance to hang out with Travis. We were at essentially this preacher's boot camp in Waco. We were hanging out with JP and some of the staff at Harris Creek, and they were pouring into people who pour into young adults and college students, and uh, we had that chance to hang out, to grab a workout, and we formed a friendship, and he was kind enough to invite me here to be with you, and I am so excited to be here. We're going to be digging into Romans 12, 1 and 2, and we're concluding this series, Scandalous Grace, and man, uh, grace is something that's hard to comprehend because it's this unmerited favor that we don't deserve. And we're going to talk about mercy, which is the withholding of the thing we actually do deserve. But before we get into the word, uh, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are good. And I just ask that we lay aside any presuppositions around what we think might happen tonight. Why ever we might be here, God. And I pray to just, you have your way. That you open our minds and soften our hearts so that your word dives into broken places. I pray that wounds are healed. I pray that you leave here with courage you did not have before. And I pray that you leave this room changed because that's what Jesus offers. Let me pray this all in his name. Amen. So we're we're digging into Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to dig into it. Uh, So Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, again, the withholding of what we do deserve. So in view of that, a reasonable response for that is to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love that the verse starts with therefore. Uh, We see a lot of therefores and a so that, and a but God in the Bible. And I am thankful that my life has a but God story. And maybe you have one, or maybe you're going to leave with one tonight. But in spite of ourselves, God meets us. God meets us where we are, and he loves us enough to not leave us as we are. He offers change. He offers new life. I grew up in a super, super small town. Anyone from a small town? So you know, so it it only takes one person to know one thing about your life for everybody to know everything about your life. And what people knew about me is when I was 14, my mom was letting me drive uh, this car that we had to basketball practice and I got in an accident. And when I got in an accident, the, you know, the cops came and the cop asked me for my ID and I was, or my license, and I was like, I don't have it. And he was like, is it at home? Do you know the number? I'm like, no, I don't have a license. I'm 14. I don't have one. And I got in a little bit of trouble, but he was like, oh, it, aren't you such and such as son? Aren't, you know, doesn't your aunt work at the school? And then called my mom, and she picked me up, and I only got in a little bit of trouble. But everyone found out about that story. And another thing that everyone knew about me in the small town that I grew up in was that I didn't have a dad. And that's a reality for so many people. Fatherlessness in this country is skyrocketing. And maybe fatherlessness, it has a lot of different ways it works. Maybe you were like me as you'll hear that my dad was never in my life. Uh, Maybe there was death or divorce, or maybe even your dad was in your home, but he was trying so hard to provide for you that he was never present. And you felt fatherless. 
And when we don't have the guidelines and the guardrails and the nurturing that we need, it sets us up for pain. It sets us up for failure. And for me, that was, that was my story where my mom was 15 when she got pregnant with me, 16 when she had me. And in this small town, my dad was the same age. And as I got older, you know, we're talking about one gas station, one grocery store. So the probability of me seeing him very high. And even though he was my dad, he never chose to be my father. And the way that our brain works is that we resolve conflict regardless of we have a logical explanation or not. Our brains are wired to resolve conflict. And the way that we do that, if we don't have a logical explanation for what's happening, we create a narrative that makes sense. And more often than not, we take the blame. So as a little kid that was really confused, I created the narrative that it was my fault that he chose not to be my dad. And that meant there must be something wrong with me. So I felt inadequate. I felt confused. And I thought, maybe if I become enough, I will feel as if I'm enough. If I do enough, I will feel as if. I'm enough, if I'm a good enough student, if I'm the best athlete, if I win the awards and have the accolades and have the applause, maybe, just maybe, I will feel good enough. But the problem with that is you only feel good for a moment. It doesn't stick. It doesn't work. But I tried really hard, and I did all the stuff. I was the best student. I was the best athlete. I went to college. I played College basketball. I did, I did all the stuff. And I started modeling and acting when I was around 13. And I studied theater. And then I moved to Hollywood when I was around 21 years old. And I'm doing all the stuff. But I share with you that something happened when I was 13 to shape me. Um, when I was 13 years old, I saw pornography for the first time. And in today's age, three years ago, the average age of exposure was eight years old. I'm sorry, the average age of exposure three years ago was 11. Today, it's eight years old. The porn industry, it makes more money than the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball all combined. 35% of all the data transferred worldwide on the Internet is pornography. Out of the top 10 websites in the world, two of them were pornography. I just got back from... Portland, Oregon, I was speaking at a Barna event. Barna is dedicated to research, and they take data, and they paint pictures, and the data they produced was that 92% of 18 to 24-year-olds that identify as follower of Jesus, guys, are watching porn once a month, 67% Girls, 18 and 24, watching porn once a month. And the thing with surveys and data, it's only good as people are honest. So the assumption it is worse. So the reality of people in this room struggling with it is 100%. But here's what's also true. Romans 8.1 says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So shame is is not from God. Shame is not your identity. Shame keeps you stuck where you are. That's the difference of shame and guilt. And as you hear, that's a big part of my story. Guilt is I did something wrong or bad that was hurtful to me or hurtful to others. I ought not do it. I should get away from it. Shame is I did something. Now this is who I am. And if it's, if it's who I am, then it makes sense that I continue to do it. Because I am what I do. So I'm out in, I'm out in uh, Hollywood. I'm, I'm doing all the stuff. And then at the age of 22, I get asked a question that I didn't expect to get asked. Three girls walk up to me and they say, hey, um, we work with an agent in the porn industry. And we want to know, would you be interested in doing a movie? And... It was not anything I ever considered. 
I had seen porn. I was living a very promiscuous lifestyle. And because of that, I didn't have a good reason to say no. And when you don't have a good reason to say no, you'll say yes to something you ought to say no to. Your foundation matters. Because we either have an opportunity to respond in a reactionary way or a responsive way. Reactionary is a, a, a person or a circumstance dictates what I do. Responsive behavior is there's something that's bigger than me that I'm committed to, and I'm going to allow that foundation be the thing that's indicative of my decision. My core beliefs, what I'm committed to, those things are going to impact what I do, not my feelings, not someone else, not the world. We're not to be conformed by the world. So, but that's where I was. And, and the Bible is a gift. It's a gate and a weapon. It protects us and equips us. But I didn't know the Bible. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And I didn't, have a, I didn't even have a picture of what a healthy relationship looked like. So the pornography that I saw depicted, well, maybe this is what love is. Maybe this is what intimacy is. And I said yes to something I should have said no to. And I met with this agent, and he promised me all the things. That I'd get rich, that I'd be famous, that I'd do all this stuff. And I didn't count the cost. And I did a film. And when you don't count the cost, when you do something, it's going to cost you more than you think. And it ruined my life. The agent and the mainstream agent that represented me after I did that and it came out, they said, hey, I think a lot of you. I even care about you as a person, but we can't represent you anymore. We can't be tied to someone that would do that. And then, again, back to the small town, word travels quickly. It only takes one person to see that. For it to get back to someone, and, that, and then someone else told my mom. My mom called me, and she was like, you know, if you guys know the deal. It's like growing up in the South, it's like how much of your mom's name, you know, how much of your name your mom uses is how much trouble you're in. So it's like Joshua Luke Broom, did you, did you do this? And I was like, yeah, I did. And I felt so much shame. And for me, I wasn't really sure who I was, but the thing that I was most sure about was that I was my mother's son. And what I mean by that is that the thing that I was most sure about is that if I was hurt, my mom would help me. If I was in need, she would rescue me. She was always there for me. She never hurt me, and she always helped me. And then when I hurt the only person that never hurt me, what I did was... I proved myself right. Because that little lie that was in that little boy's head that said that I was no good, because my daddy didn't want me, I was no good, I proved to myself that I was no good. And then I was like, well, if this is who I am, then it makes sense that I continue doing bad things. And I stayed in that industry for six years. And while I was in that industry, I thought, well, if I make enough money, then maybe that money will supersede those feelings of inadequacy. And I was even tracking on a little chart. I actually had a dry erase board, like, in my bathroom. And I was, like, you know, tra like tracking my money. And I was like, well, when I eclipse a million dollars earned, then something about that metric I attached to satisfaction. And I thought that somehow that would overcome the way that I felt. And then I made that amount of money. I made that amount of money. And then what? Nothing changed. And I thought, well, um, if I become the best in that industry, if I am the most celebrated person in that industry, if I'm the most famous, then uh, maybe that would make me feel different. And I got nominated for Performer of the Year four years in a row. And then in 2012, I won it. And I had attached my worth 
to winning that award. And when I won the award and I made that money and it didn't work, guess what? My anxiety that already existed amplified. The depression that already existed deepened. And when the things didn't fix me, I thought, well, nothing can. What's the point? I'm broken. I can't be fixed. I'm no good. What's the point of living? And I was wrestling with suicidal ideation the whole time I was in that industry because I was just thinking about how dirty I felt and how worthless I felt. And then I made a plan to take my life. And on this day, I even needed someone's opinion so that I would do it. I needed someone to agree with me so I could do the thing I wanted to do. And the way that I was going to get them to do that is I was going to go into a bank and on the checks that I had, on the memo it said what I was being paid for. It was clear what I was doing. And before that moment, I had not gone into a bank. I did you know, mobile deposit, ATM deposit, like any, anything other than handing the check to a person so that person could look me in the eye and see what I was being paid for. I didn't want to know part of that, but on this day, that's exactly what I wanted. And also, my mom continued pursuing me, calling me, texting me, my fraternity brothers reaching out to me, saying, hey, dude, what are you doing? You're better than this. I love you. You, you could be doing something else. Like, what are you doing? And the way that accountability works is that if I allow you to speak into my life and you say something, hey, you're, you're not living up to the capacity or the standard that I know that you should be or you are committed to, I've got two ways of responding. Either, thank you for telling me. Man, I need to fix this and I would love to spend some time with you and let's talk about it. Or, don't tell me what to do and I push that person away. And I'd pushed everyone away to the extent where in that industry, you don't even go by your real name. You go by a pseudonym. You go by a fake name. So I hadn't even heard my real name in over a year. This is how lost I was. So I walk into the bank and I slide the check across the counter and I'm waiting on her to like give me a dirty look or shake her head or say something under her breath. I just needed something to fuel me so that I could do the thing I wanted to do because I just wanted to be done. And I slid the check across the counter. She said, nothing, nothing. And did the transaction, handed me the receipt. And as I go to walk away, she steps around the counter and says, Joshua, can I help you? Joshua, what's going on? Are you okay? Because I was sweating. I was freaked out. I was scared out of my mind. And when she said my name that I had not heard in a year, like something happened. There's this picture of this in, in Acts 16. Like Paul and disciples, they're out crushing it. They're baptizing people and delivering you know, people from demons and doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden they end up in prison. And then in prison there's this jailer and he has one job. To make sure the people stay where they're put. There's an earthquake. The jail cells open up. And then he's like, I blew it. I'm a loser. I'm done. Corporal punishment is not an option. It's the expectation. I'm going to die, so I'm just going to do it myself. He grabs a sword, and Paul simply says, don't harm yourself. I'm right here. In moments of despair, sometimes we need to be seen, we need to be known, and there's someone in your life that maybe just needs to hear from you, I see you. I care about you. And the byproduct of that was that jailer asked, hey, what do I need to do to be saved? And then his whole family was saved and what happened in my story is I ran for my life instead of taking my life, and I called my mom. And when I called her, she chewed me out. <laughs> she chewed me out because I hadn't been returning her calls for a year. And the reality is, in that industry, to this day, so I've been out of that industry for almost 11 years. I've been out of that industry for almost 11 years. And 35 people that I know that were my friends have committed suicide. So... The reality of, is my son okay? 
It was a very serious question, and I was withholding from her the answer. And when I called her, she was upset, but she was so glad. And then she told me, hey, you will always be my son. And I am angry with you, but I love you so much. Please come home. So I did, but what I brought with me was the baggage of the mental and emotional trauma of living the life that I lived. And the belief that I'm not good enough, so maybe I can fix myself. So I do the same thing. I go and I work in the strength and conditioning world. I'm working at a gym, get a great mentor, get the right credentials, get a job at the best gym, work my way up, got a bunch of clients. I'm working with a lot of cool people. I'm making money, but nothing's changed in my heart and my mind. And then after about two years of this, this girl walks in this gym, and she's the prettiest girl I've ever seen, and I ask her on a date. She says no, um, but <laughs> I continue to pursue her, and she didn't know that that rejection, like, oh, I, I just fell in love with you. Um, but I continue to ask her. She said no to a dinner, no to a date, but yes to a run, and we, I meet her for the run, and, you know, I, I'm making sure that my fit's in check. I'm making sure, like, you know, I'm, I'm looking good. And then I start feeling like, man, I bet she doesn't know my story. And if she knew my story, she would want nothing to do with me. And then as soon as she gets there, I'm like, hey, I got, I got something to tell you. And I, I tell her everything. I tell her, every, I black out, you know, five-minute monologue of, hey, this is how bad I am. And she's like, are you still doing this stuff? And I'm like, no, it, I, I haven't been doing that stuff for two years. That's, that's not what I do anymore, but that is who I am. And she looked at me, and she got really serious, and she said, you are not defined by the worst thing you've ever done. And you are not defined by the greatest thing you'll ever do either. There's a God that exists outside of time, space, and matter, and he was the catalyst for all those things, and he created me and you. And I don't want to minimize the pain that you have in your life. I don't want to say that. You know, what you went through wasn't hard. I don't want to say that, you know, you not having a dad in your life, you know, that didn't impact you. But what I want to tell you is this. There is one author of you, and it's not you. It's God. Do you know him? And I didn't. And she shared with me that she had been following Jesus since she was in seventh grade. And she was like, I'm not perfect by any means, but my foundation of my life is built on my relationship with him. And then we walked and talked, and she invited me to church. And I didn't really think I had any business at church, but I really wanted to follow that pretty girl. And I, I followed her there. And there I heard this sermon out of, you know, we, you guys talked about this last time, which is, I think is uh, Holy Spirit-driven, but uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, this interaction with David, Zeba, Mephibosheth, and David is, is looking for a way to repay the kindness that Jonathan has showed him. And he's going to extend this loving kindness from God to someone. He has just rebuilt the temple, and now he's looking to extend this kindness to someone. He remembers this promise to his friend Jonathan from 1 Samuel. And he asks, hey, is there anyone left out of the house of Saul? And they find Mephibosheth in this place, Lodabar, that you talked about, this, this place of no pastor, um, you know, this, this wasteland, and he's hiding there because he thinks, I deserve death. And David brings him into his kingdom, and he says, hey, I'm going to offer to you your grandfather's land, and not just any land, Canaan. So he's inviting him into the promised land, and he's saying, hey, you're going to be part of this kingdom, and you're going to sit at my table, not for a day, not for a week, forever. He says, Grace unmerited favor that we do not deserve a beautiful picture of it but then i was with you you know i, I was I'm, I'm 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 listening to what you're hearing and then i hear second samuel chapter 9 verse 8 when essentially mephibosheth hears everything that david says and his response is why are you offering that to a dead dog like me aka don't you know who i am don't you know what i've done 
we have such a hard time in the same way understanding the grace of God because we think something that we've done is more powerful than what Jesus did on the cross. So we, we disqualify ourselves from the grace of God. As I was sitting there saying, you don't know my story. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said to, to, to people. You don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. My own daddy didn't want me. Don't you know that? Like, what, what are you talking about? And then he shares Hebrews 12 too. He shares that Jesus, as he approaches the cross, says that he had joy in his heart. It was joy set before him as he scorns our, our shame. And he's seated at the right hand of God. And he's sitting because he's done. But what I was focused on was like joy. How do I, joy, why, why would you have joy? I understand at this point, Jesus is perfect. If Jesus is God, then he's perfect. And of course, he's obedient to his father. So yes, he did what he was supposed to do, but he had joy in his heart. That doesn't make sense. And then all of a sudden, it hit me. God wrapped himself in flesh, came into this world, faced every temptation, but never sinned. And he was beaten, and he was spat on, and he was humiliated. And he had joy in his heart as an omniscient, all-knowing God goes to the cross to die for you and for me. Why? Because he loves you. Because you deserve it? No. Because you're his. When I understood that God loved me and the father that I long for, I had access to because he made a way for me when I could never make a way that changed everything. And in that moment, I gave my life. I surrendered my life to Jesus. And that girl that was brave enough to tell me the truth and to, to point me to church, um, her name is Hope. And we've been married for eight years and we have four kids. And uh, that's... That's, that's us, and the, the, the beautiful thing about that picture is I had just preached convocation at Liberty University to 11,000 students, and I was a student at Liberty University. And I remember as a freshman at university, I thought if any of these professors knew who I was, I would get kicked out or I would be so ashamed. And what happened was my theology changed my belief because I understood that the cross undid everything. So it allowed me to have a, a lesser view of myself in that how important I was and a greater view of the cross. Because the cross changes everything. And I want you to remember this. If you're taking notes, write this down. When you know who you are, it doesn't matter who you're not. When you know who you are, it doesn't matter who you're not. In this world, when we're wrestling with comparison, comparison is the thief of joy. And when you're trying to live someone else's life, you're always going to be unsatisfied. And if you believe that that person on Instagram with more followers than you, or that person with the title that you want, or whatever it has, it's not going to fix your heart. And God's not going to bless the person that you pretend to be. And when you spend your life trying to live out someone else's calling and purpose, guess what? You're never going to be satisfied because God, when he created you, he got down on bended knee. And with earth, with soil, he formed you together and breathed his breath into your lungs. Your skin color, your personality, with the things that you're good at, those, all those things are unique to you. And there's a plan for your life. There's a calling on your life. And when you spend your time trying to do things that other people are doing so that you think that you're going to get what they got, you're wrong. You're wrong. That is Satan's plan for your life. 
Satan didn't say, hey, uh, go eat the fruit so you'll ruin your life. He's like, did God really say? If Satan can get you to doubt God, you think you will know better. And even worse, you'll listen to people. We're not to be conformed by the world. We're to be transformed. So all that being said, sharing my story with you and not being conformed by the world, how, how, do, how did I get to this place, right? How, how did uh, someone that was in the porn industry become a preacher? The reality is I'm not a porn star that's got this crazy story that became a Christian that I preach about. No, I, God made me to be a preacher. And God loves me enough, like we were singing about, God uses all things for who? His glory, his plan, his purpose. So whatever it is in your life, whatever broken pieces, throw it at his feet, at the cross, and he's going to redeem all of it. And he's going to use all of it. Whatever it is, the most broken parts of you, he is the one that's going to make a masterpiece out of it. You can't fix you. But he can. So we're looking at Romans 12 and thinking about, okay, if it says therefore, there must have been something preceding that. So the Bible tells us, though, that from him and for him and through him, all things that are made. Everything's about Jesus. John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. As the chapter goes on, it tells us that nothing was made that was made without God. He was there in the beginning, and he is the end. So if that's true, we have to wrestle with that. We have to wrestle with the reality that God has made himself known through his creation, and he's told us. He's told us in his word. So all means all. So yes, he redeems all things, but there's another all. That Romans uh, Romans 3.23 says, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all means all. And then Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. When it says death, we're talking about an eternal separation from God. There's an absolute fact, all of us will die. But where we spend forever is contingent on a choice that you make. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that you will not perish. Eternal life is available To you, but it comes one way, one truth, one life. John 14, 6 says that no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus speaking. There's one way. But I love that Romans 6, 23 continues, and it doesn't just leave us at the wages of sin is death. It says, but, but God, but God. So, but The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we were called into something. There's an offer for us. And if we're in in response to that, there's a therefore. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Again, mercy is the withholding of what we do deserve. So a reasonable response To God interceding in our life when we were approaching death, he offers us life. And a reasonable response to that is to give him our life. A reasonable response to the gift of God is to give him our life, all of it. As my friend JP that we were hanging out with, he says, Jesus doesn't do well in the back seat. Jesus is Lord over everything. Your mind, your body, the way that you look at sex, friendship, everything. He's Lord over everything. Over and over, Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, but I say this. He is Lord over everything. Not a dot, not an iota of his word will pass away until it's all fulfilled. Why can he say that? Because he is God. And he loves us so much that he came into this world and died for us to pay a debt we couldn't pay. He loves you that much. 
So that is the thing that changed, that changed everything for me. So I just want you to know, like, if you're in this room and you're struggling with pornography, there's, it's such a huge problem. But the problem is not porn. The problem is you think there was something in your life that porn could fix, and all of a sudden you're stuck. Your heart is desiring intimacy, and you have believed because of the world and because of what Satan is doing that that's going to satisfy you. Or maybe hooking up is going to satisfy you. Or maybe doing enough is going to satisfy you. And there's one thing your heart was created to long for, and he was the one that created it. It's God. You cannot satisfy yourself because you were not made to. I'm thinking about David, King David, David and Goliath. But as we know, David is imperfect, yet we say that he's a man after God's own heart. We see his, his imperfection in that David was not somewhere he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be in battle. And then he saw something he should not have seen in Bathsheba bathing. And then he had a choice. He could either do what the Bible says to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ or do what I want and look again. He looked again and then he did something he should not have done. And then when he did something he should not have done, he did not own it. He tried to cover it up. And that led to destruction in his life. Yes, the, the story goes on and because of a friend that loved them enough to tell them the truth, there was repentance and heart change, but... It could have been a different story, but we look at Joseph. Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, and he ran. It's like, yes, the Bible says flee from sexual immorality, but it's important where you run to. Because Joseph wasn't running from sin. He was running to God. Because, you know, there's, there's salvation, and then there's sanctification, and then there's glorification. And in your sanctification, we're, we're in the, the not, year, you know, not there yet. And sanctification is kind of like an onion. When you think you got one thing figured out, you're going to find something else. It's messy. And I want to share with you this. I, I didn't plan on sharing this. Um, we're going to dig into uh, Ephesians 2.10 really quick. But I just want to share this with you. It's the last service, so if I go over, there's grace, right? We're talking about grace, right? So, um, so God's done a lot of beautiful things in my life. I get to travel the world preaching. I do this full time. I speak at 60 to 70 different places a year, um, and it's a gift. But how did I get here, you know, 10 years later, uh, deep discipleship, deep discipleship, and a commitment to tell the truth. And what I want to share with you is you're, you're only going to be as free as you're willing to be honest. You're only going to be healed to the extent that you're willing to be honest. And through deep discipleship and a phone call or a meeting that I have every Friday, we call them hot conversations, honest, open, transparent. And I confess not the things that I do, the things that I think. Because if you confess when it's small, it'll never take you to a place that you didn't want to go. I need to take inventory of my life. What am I allowing into my life? Do they align with who I say I want to be and where I say I want to go? Because if it doesn't align with those things, they need to go. Don't get caught up in calling something comfort when it's actually compromise. The words that you use matter. And you need boundaries in your life. You need clear boundaries. The way that you have clear boundaries is you set them and they're non-negotiable. Discipline, discipline is important. It's been said before that discipline is the greatest form of self-love. Do you keep promises to you? So as I was going on this journey... I'm preaching, I'm doing all this stuff, I'm writing books, like, like, God is good, this is great. Then all of a sudden I find myself, I'm not struggling with lust, but I'm like really wrestling with anger. And maybe it's because I'm tired, I, I don't know, but I'm, I find myself really angry and 
Uh, specifically, I get angry when there is an opportunity for me to lust, and I still think things I, I know I shouldn't think, and I, I take them captive, and I confess them, but I, I wrestle with, well, I thought that I was going to change. I didn't think I was going to think those things anymore. I didn't think I was going to be affected by that anymore. And I was really struggling with anger. And then I was laying in bed, and um, I felt God, like, wait, wait, he, like, woke me up. It was, like, 3 a.m. I felt prompted to pray, and I'm just, like, laying in the bed. And I'm, like, I'm going to be lazy and just pray right here. And I felt God speak to me and say, do you fear me? Like, the fear of God, the, the reverence of God. Do you see me for who I am? Do you fear me? So I was like, okay, on my face. And in that place, God showed me that that anger, it was stemming from my thought. That, Dad, if you would have been there, these things wouldn't have happened to me. Dad, if you would have been there, I wouldn't have done those things. Dad, if you would have told me what I needed to know, I wouldn't have done those things. Dad, now because of you, I have to have these hard conversations with my kids. Dad, because of you, my wife has to see some of these things that she sent online. It's your fault. If you would have been there, I wouldn't be going through this. This is your fault. And I realized I was wrestling with bitterness and unforgiveness. And here's what's true, and it's hard. We're called to forgive regardless of if reconciliation is going to meet your expectations. And what I mean by that is I'm called to forgive my dad even if he doesn't choose to be my dad. I'm called to forgive him even if nothing changes. You're called to forgive that person even if they don't fix the friendship. We're called to forgive. Why? Because we've been forgiven. And I thought still in my mind that putting my shoulders back and doing right was the way to get to where I wanted to go. But it's here. It is in surrender that you'll find everything you're looking for. Peace, healing, connection. So I had to forgive him even if he doesn't change. And that healed something in me. Because unforgiveness, it only hurts one person. You. So Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for, prepared in advance for us to do. So we are God's handiwork, as we talked about. God created you. You were created in God's image. He knitted you together in your mother's womb, numbered the hairs on your head, knows everything about you. The closer you get to God, the more you become the person you were created to be. Proximity to God is the real definition of intimacy. Most people would say sex. Sex is in the bucket of intimacy, in the confines of marriage, but intimacy, by definition, is proximity to God. And when you allow God to love you and you love him back, you see love rightly. And all of a sudden, you can love yourself and others rightly. God wants to change you and change your story. You're his handiwork. You're his poem. You're his masterpiece. He's the artist. We're the canvas. He's the potter. We're the clay. We are not to be molded by the world. We're to be conformed to his image by his word. I'll leave you with this. It's a, it's a quote from one of my favorite theologians, Dallas Willard. 
says this. Super challenging. It says, there isn't a single thing that Jesus said that we cannot do. There is not a single thing that Jesus said that we cannot do. And there is not a single thing that Jesus said that we can do on our own. But praise God that he does not leave us on our own. He is with you. He is for you. And he's looking at you, not saying, oh, you did it again. Oh, you did that. He's saying, take one step towards me. Test me. Take one step towards me and watch what I do. We look at the prodigal son, what happens? You take one step towards your father, he puts a ring on your finger, he puts shoes on your feet, he puts a robe around your back, and he says, this is my son, this is my daughter, I'm gonna throw a party because my son, my daughter has come home. He loves you. He loves you that much. He celebrates when you take one step towards him. He's not counting your mistakes. He's calling you closer. He's not saying do better, do the right thing. He's saying come to me. And in that place, you will find everything that you're looking for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every person in this room. We thank you for your spirit that I feel so clearly in this room, so heavy in this room. There's hurting people in this room that want freedom. God, I ask that you touch them, that you touch them in a tangible way so they know how loved they are by you. And God, I know that there's people that walked in this room that don't know the answer to, if I died today, would I spend forever with you? The Bible is clear. There's one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus. Romans 3.23 says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've lied, we've lusted, we've done something that the Bible says in Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. The cost of our sin is death. But the free gift of God in Christ Jesus is eternal life. Romans 10, 9 says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that he rose from the grave, you will be saved. So I just say to the people that I I just feel so, so overwhelmingly drawn to in this room, I just say that don't leave here today as you walked in. I'm going to pray a prayer, and there's no prayer that I can pray for you, but if you pray this prayer in your heart of hearts and you believe it with conviction, your life will change. Jesus I'm a sinner. I've lied. I've fallen short. I'm tired and I can't go anymore. I've tried to fix myself and I can't. I believe that you sent your son Jesus who was perfect in every way. to die for me. I place my faith in him. I place my faith in Jesus. I give you my life. And I ask you to change me. I ask you to fill me with your spirit so that I can follow you with all of my life, for the rest of my life. God, make me 
new. If you've just prayed that, I believe that something is solidified in you when you feel prompted and respond spiritually and then follow it by responding physically. If you just pray that prayer, raise your hand high. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to hear something from God, from my lips. This comes straight from the Bible. He says to you, maybe you haven't heard this in a long time, and I know I needed to hear it when I made that decision. He's looking at you, and he's saying, son, I'm proud of you. Daughter, I'm proud of you. This is my son. This is my daughter whom I'm well pleased. He's proud of you. You are now his children. And if you're in this room and you've been carrying something for too long, you have a relationship with Jesus, but there's something that's on you that you, you just want to get off. There's, there's something that you want freedom from. Maybe it's, maybe it's vaping. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's anger. Maybe you need to forgive someone. There's something that you can't do, and you need Jesus Christ to free you from the thing you cannot free yourself from. If you want freedom from something, raise your hand high. Who wants freedom in this place? Who wants freedom in this place? Praise Jesus. We thank you that you're good. And where your spirit is, there is freedom. And you do not, you not only meet us where we are, you don't leave us as we are. So God, I pray for each and every person. God, I pray that we are not afraid to take the next step. Because you meet us and you change us and we're called to walk in the things in which you prepared beforehand for us to do. So God, I pray that we do the thing. We do the thing that we need to do, God. We take the next step, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for everything you've done in this room. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.